Hi everyone, I'm excited to introduce our next hub. We are going to Berlin. Berlin has always had an active plan to direct new ways of thinking and living. The Charité Hospital has begun studies with MDMA and psychedelics and has also created an emergency room for people who need guidance and support after a psychedelic experience by themselves. This hub is hosted by the new health club, Atai Life Sciences, Dr. Bronner's and The Factory. And I will hand this over to you, Catherine Bischoff from The Factory, who is live now in Berlin. Hi, Catherine. Welcome from Factory Berlin. We are at the heart of Berlin's tech and startup ecosystem and we're super happy to be hosting this today and listening to these interesting speakers. And without further ado, I'm going to get Anne on stage to continue the discussions. Thanks and cheers from Berlin. Hi, everybody. I don't know where actually I look here. I look here. I don't know. I'm just looking on this screen. <laughs> now we're going to sit down um, because I have these great guys here now to talk to. So um, first of all, welcome to these great people. We have a couple in the room, but I mean, I know these days it's not so easy to do this, but so I'm really happy that everybody can join online. So our topic today is um, where do psychedelics go in 2021? And we have two people here who will have a lot to do with the development of this um, interesting industry or, or renaissance we're just experiencing. So Graham Boyd, the political director of Dr. Bronner's, uh, I think you're in um, Santa Cruz right now, are you? Yeah, that's right. Favorite place in California. And uh, Christian Angermeyer, uh, the founder of Atai Life Sciences and many other endeavors in the psychedelic field. He is in London at the moment, right? Exactly. Okay. So welcome guys. And um, so we jump right in. So I was reading this article yesterday um, from 2018 from the Rolling Stone. And um, the headline was psilocybin could be legal for therapy by 2021, which is next year. So what are the, where are we right now in this, with this state? What is the current situation if we enter next year, which is like in two months, three months? Well, I start. Yeah. Well, you are the moderator, darling. You need to you need to tell us who is allowed. Yeah, to... Christian. Okay, you should start because who is allowed to speak? Thriving force. In this um, yeah. So so I, I maybe give the answer from from the legal in terms of uh, medically legal, like availably medical, because um, the the company I guess the article is referring to um, is one of my portfolio companies, uh, Compass Pathways, uh, which actually just did a very successful IPO. Uh, in the US, um, um, so it's sort of a, can also be publicly followed. Um, and Compass is actually announcing its phase two B data, phase two B data next year. So that's 2021. So that doesn't mean it's approved then, because uh, for for the guys in the audience, so you have three stages of um, approval for uh, for medical drugs, which is phase one, phase two, phase three. So after phase to be obviously comes phase three, which will take some more years. Yeah. There are some um, options which the FDA can take after phase two B totally on their sort of discretion. Um, it's called compassionate use, early access, yeah, um, which is then to be seen. Yeah. So the phase two B data for sure of Compass next year will be a very decisive event um, for the psychedelics industry. And obviously, I'm um, I hope and optimistic that it's going to be a very good one, but then there will be time. So I, I, I don't see that, uh, unfortunately, uh, but again, it's going to be happen soon, but not next year for medical use of psychedelics in generally and, and, um, and, and sort of cyber and magic mushrooms sort of on the forefront. There is one other uh, trial I really love going on. They're going to come out in two weeks. This is MAPS. I don't even know if Rick Doblin is maybe here somewhere on the agenda as well. If not, yeah, I'm going to sing his song. Um, so MAPS is doing a, a fantastic job in pushing MDMA uh, for the treatment of PTSD. And they have their readout, um, I think, in two weeks for phase three. So it could indeed well be that MDMA 
um, uh, which some count as a psychedelic, some not, is sort of available medically uh, as early as next year. Graham, what is your perception of the whole situation right now? I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sort of take a slightly wider um, focus in, in my lens. I certainly agree with what Christian said, and I think that the developments around psilocybin and MDMA as a prescription drug is one of the most exciting and, and absolutely necessary parts of, of, of the broader movement. And I would say that from this sort of broader lens, if you think about psychoactive substances of any sort, the laws that we impose influence human behavior, but they don't control it. Uh, for, the, for you know, at least 100 years now around the globe and, and often starting with the United States, there have been laws which try to tell people when and how and in what circumstances they can use these substances. And if you're on the wrong side of that line, you risk going to prison. That, that's the regime that we've been living under. And despite that, people have been using these substances in all sorts of ways. Um, and, and, and by being driven into the underground by these criminal laws, those ways aren't opt are not optimal. Um, generally, they're more dangerous and, and they're less beneficial. And so what's exciting around the world right now is both the research leading to prescription use, but in addition to that, there's decriminalization, which is removing or at least reducing the threat of arrest for people who are using psychedelics. That's, that's a sort of second area. And then a third area, and David not referred to this in the previous panel, are efforts to allow for therapeutic or wellness or you know, indeed even medical uses that aren't within a prescription context. So the, the ballot initiative in Oregon is an example of that. The compassionate use program for psilocybin in Canada, um, which is just, just starting to open up as an example of that. So I think if we look forward even just a handful of years, we're going to be in a place where there is prescription access for people with serious medical conditions. There is, you know, not in a doctor's office, but still under sort of supervised therapeutic circumstances, that mode of access, which Oregon is, is, is you know, exploring. And then finally, there will be people who choose to use it, not for medical or therapeutic reasons, but yet don't face the risk of arrest. And I think this is all for the good and all is sort of happening simultaneously. Okay. So, I mean, Christian, you, I mean, with Atai, you do a lot of things. You, you're very, you had a really amazing progress the last year. So, I mean, like we were talking all, always in these conferences about how the, uh, the speed of the development with drugs is actually happening at the same time. The legal framework is sometimes difficult to predict. So as one of the yeah, biggest psychedelic companies that you're involved with, so how would you say what is a good strategy at the moment to kind of go ahead as a company who's in the psychedelic field and who's also producing maybe compounds to, to use it? It's a very broad question. I, I would like to, 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 to I mean, I, I, I loved how Graham pointed it out because I think we have to come, and then I come to your question. Yeah, and Graham, you already said it perfectly. I just want to use that. You have to come from the question, for whom are we actually doing that? So because it's not a self-serving thing. So you have people who, for various reasons, want to use it or want to have access to it. And I think Graham sort of divided it very well, sort of into the people who really need it because they have a, a mental health issue from depression to post-traumatic stress disorder, anxiety, addiction, whatever, yeah, then people who sort of might also want to improve their life, sort of in a, as you called it, wellness, yeah, but maybe have not a really hardcore, deep depression, and then you have sort of the recreational use. So our view from a tie is very much obviously that the number one priority sort of in the pyramid should have the, um, the people who really desperately need it, and unfortunately, uh, and I listened a little bit to David Nutt's uh, talk before, it's hundreds of millions of people who really suffer from, and most likely it's even more because the, the gray number is very big because uh, mental health is, is still a very stigmatized um, group of diseases, yeah. So, and I think the number one priority should be 
on, on giving these people access to the drugs yeah, and to these, from my point of view, very powerful uh, solutions. Yeah, and the important thing is if you have depression, for example, yeah, you also, not just because it's sort of the legal framework or it will be the legal framework, but also if I, and I have seen friends of mine uh, in a very, very positive outcome, yeah, very great success being treated who had severe depression, for example, with uh, psychedelics, but their treatment is not, hey, I go to the beach and have a fun afternoon. Yeah, so they are, because these, uh, these mental health issues, they have, they have a source often in trauma or in some other very deep underlying conditions. And the great thing is psychedelics go right there and sort of dissolve that trauma. But that process is not always very easy. And this can also go very easy wrong if you don't have a really trained therapist. It doesn't mean a medical doctor because aside of ibogaine, yeah, um, the, the, the medical, the physical downside is extremely, extremely low, but like you needed a very trained psychotherapist from my point of view next to you. This is why, so we are very focused on these medical use, uh, use case. Yeah. At the same time, by the way, hundred percent agree with Graham because I'm doing it regularly. Yeah. And people like me shouldn't need it to be think about, Hey, in which country I'm doing it now, what's the legal status, whatever. Yeah. It should be hundred percent decriminalized. Yeah. Things like that should not be in any form um, uh, criminalized at all. And I think we're getting there. And I think there is a beautiful sort of synergy because the more the medical companies like at my Atai or Compass, whatever, are proving the safety and the positive effects, the harder it is for politics also to really hardcore criminalize yeah, those drugs. So it's going a little bit uh, hand in hand. So my view is obviously to come into your question that sort of the, uh, the business opportunity is in the medical field because there you also need a tremendous amount of investment. So it's it's very expensive to approve a single drug. And for example, my company at High is working on 12 drugs, mental health drugs at the moment, seven of them are psychedelic. Yeah, and you can always say like, as a super, super raw number, you need like plus minus hundred million dollar per drug to get these drugs to a so-called proof of concept not talking about rolling them out, whatever. Yeah, so, so the investment or sort of the business opportunity is in the, I think in the medical, in the biotech field of it, yeah. Nevertheless, uh, we're supporting MAPS, yeah. Um, I support some decrim stuff, yeah, because that's uh, equally important to move forward, but that's more maybe um, a social thing and not a, not a business opportunity. Okay, Graham, um, you, I mean, doc, with Dr. Bronis and other activities you're doing, you're very much involved in a decrim movement in, in America. And we had also a couple of people, um, Melissa Lavasani from decrim Washington, Daniel Carcillo from Chicago. Then we're going to have Sherry and Tom Eckert soon on the podcast. So, I mean, it's interesting how individuals, you could say, are driving um, this forward on a very kind of a human <laughs> being level, which I find interesting because they all have their personal stories that made them getting into psychedelics. So what is your, how would you describe your approach also in context of Dr. Bronner's, um, yeah, to kind of support decriminalize um, movement in, in America, which, I mean, which is going to be very interesting in the next two weeks, what's going to happen after the election. Mm -hmm. Well, Christian's certainly right that the, the decrim movement in particular is much more of a social and political movement than a, um, you know, you don't need $100 million of, of clinical trials and scientific research in order to decriminalize um, psilocybin or plant medicines in a jurisdiction. And, and let me just take a moment to, to, to say what I mean by decriminalize. It's actually a bit misleading how that, how that word has been used because What's being done is a local jurisdiction, usually a city like Denver or Oakland or soon the District of Columbia, will change its laws such that they instruct their local police to no longer make a priority of arresting people for possession of a personal use amount of the substance. So it's not legalization. It does, it, in fact, it remains in let's say Denver as an example, it remains technically illegal under both state and federal law to possess psilocybin. 
But the Denver police now have instructions, which is if you find somebody with a little bit of mushrooms, leave them alone. And so that that that's important, right? That's very important in terms of just personal freedom and sort of a sense of also being able to um, talk to other people and get good advice about how to best go about these activities. What we're doing in Oregon, by contrast, is really somewhere between the um, you know compass or USONA or MAPS prescription model on the one hand and decriminalization on the other. Because in Oregon, there will be a two-year process of actually creating rules and structure for training psilocybin guides. So that, I mean, Christian, you, you, you made reference to, you know, that, that you and I and many people we know have these experiences ourselves. And most people I know still want to have a trained guide be part of that experience, right? It's, it's, it's not, I mean, I think it would be foolish to go to the beach or the and have a high dose of psilocybin and have a mystical experience in the middle of the chaos going on around you. you Wait, it can be amazing, I can tell you, but I know you need the right <laughs> you need the right person uh, with you. Yeah, well, a container is what people usually talk about, and so it's you know the the Oregon system if it if it passes next week on election day, the Oregon system will have a cadre of trained. Um, and certified guides who can have these experiences and they'll be legal under state law and and there'll be a screening process. I mean, and this is, I think, so important too, is that if, if people are somewhat depressed or somewhat anxious or, or struggling somewhat with addiction or really any other kind of mental health condition, it's fantastic for them to actually be able to have access to these treatments. And if they need the more intensive experience of the sort that Compass eventually will be providing, great, that's one option. But if they need something that's less intensive, then that would also be an option under the Oregon system. So it, I, I guess what I'm saying is there should be a whole range, a spectrum of different experiences that are tailored to the degree of safety and supervision that are needed for that particular person and that particular experience. That's the future we're moving towards. Okay. So um, I read a, a great article yesterday in Benzinga, the, the great um, drug, I don't know, website magazine. And um, it was uh, talking about four things psychedelics could learn from the cannabis industry. And um, number four was, uh, please keep in mind that you still have to destigmatize the substances that you're working with. So, and I feel sometimes uh, that's my favorite thing, like posting things about psychedelics from fashion magazines, um, like Allure last week, for example, <laughs> to make sure that this is on the way and everybody gets it. But I mean, like, what is your, your take on what could be done to further destigmatize this? Of course, we have media and, and I mean, obviously, like people like Melissa and Daniel, if they talk to you, you get it immediately why, why this should happen. But I mean, what, what is your your idea of the strongest tool to destigmatize things in, in the psychedelic field? Um, Question. For, for first of all, I, I joke in joke. I always like I'm happy if fashion magazines uh, talk about it because uh, the whole psychedelic endeavor completely changed my dating life. It became it's one of the most sexy things in biotech uh, you can actually do, and it's always a great date conversation. But jokes aside, um, I think as much as I'm super happy. Because we, we, I think there has happened an, an enormous um, destigmatization sort of effect over the last 12 months. Yeah, and, and because of many, many reasons. I think it's like a puzzle because of things like Graham and Dr. Bronner is doing, of what we are doing in the medical space. I think one of the main, main drivers of the destigmatization and sort of the reintroduction of these drugs into society, we. Um, don't fuck it up, yeah, that nothing happens which would throw the whole stuff back. So this is why everybody who's watching, I would always say like, we have always a double, if you, if you do psychedelics in whichever form and whichever legal jurisdiction, at the moment, I think you always have a, a double responsibility. You always have a responsibility for yourself because these are extremely powerful drugs, which are from my deep, deep, uh, um, uh, opinion, these are not party drugs. Yeah, these are very spiritual, um, introspective drugs with, with a deep meaning, and we should use it like that in any setting. Uh, but you also have at the moment, especially people who do it have a, uh, and who talk about it, have a, 
um, a responsibility for society because I come back to what I said at the beginning, the main focus should be from all of us on the hundreds of millions of people who really suffer from depression. It's the one thing, if you like, oh, I'm going to be a little bit more creative, which is great, yeah, and, yeah, but like we should not create the problem for, for the people who really, really need it. They need it in a medical form, yeah, and uh, yeah, we shouldn't create headlines or everybody should be responsible not to do something which could sort of set the whole movement back. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, I mean, and your framing around the cannabis comparison is is apt, and I've been involved in that. I I've, I've played a guiding role in all of the um, statewide ballot initiatives in the United States to legalize cannabis. I've I've um, played a role in drafting those, and 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 currently running campaigns in South Dakota and Montana, um, involved in campaigns in New Jersey and Mississippi for cannabis reform. So some of those are, if you know American politics, quite conservative jurisdictions. And so we've, we've made tremendous progress, but it's been important that we've done it slowly and globally as well. I was, I, I actually spent a good deal of time in Uruguay working with the government there as the first nation that legalized cannabis. and. I think New Zealand may well be joining the ranks of those nations in just a few days. The votes have been cast, but not yet counted in their national referendum. So that that has been a sort of slow, steady, both national in the United States and global process of bringing cannabis from being entirely illegal to being medically used to eventually being used more broadly. And you know, Christian refers to the possibility of backlash, and let's remember that did already happen once in our recent history. In the late 1960s, there was a, a growing body of scientific evidence that, that um, psychedelics, LSD in particular, were useful for treating alcoholism and other disorders, and that all got sent you know, ba basically back to the basement and then criminalized because of a perception that it was moving too fast. Now, I'll say that just in terms of my own evolution on this, if you had talked to me a year and a half or two years ago, I would have said the only thing that should be happening around psychedelics is prescription um, drug use, research leading to prescription use. That, that's what I would have said. And once Michael Pollan's book came out, and, and the interest in psychedelics grew, it almost, I mean, what I started to see in terms of activism was a leapfrog from the prescription context all the way to full commercial legalization. In other words, psilocybin should be sold in the corner grocery store in unlimited amounts to whoever wants it for whatever reason. And that, in my view, is exactly what could spur the backlash. If it, if it went that far immediately. And that's why the decriminalization and the Oregon model are so wise, because it's continuing to place, on the one hand, don't arrest people. There's no reason to do that. But in the Oregon model, continue to put guardrails around the therapeutic use. So our societies may one day be ready for the full legalization, the sort of commercial retail availability and marketing of psychedelics for any purpose, but these are powerful substances. And so I think to do it on the cannabis model immediately would be more likely to spur backlash than this sort of incremental approach that we're currently pursuing. Yeah, and I, I would even go one step further. I think the broad, as you say, at every corner, at every moment pop shop, I think that's not, no matter if society is somewhere and ready for that, but I think it's deeply wrong because there, if you go, if you have really seen again, and I'm looking especially at the people who turn for the substances because they have a need. Yeah. If you do it without a guide, it can deeply, deeply go wrong. Yeah. This is not cannabis where you say, oh, I smoke a, a joint and I'm a little bit more relaxed. Yeah. These can be profoundly deep, but in its deepness, yeah, if it's dissolving a trauma, it can be very dark, meaning there are these, I don't like the word bad trips because the outcome of a bad trip usually is extremely good because you dissolved something, but a bad trip, or we call it rather a challenging trip without a guide can go deeply wrong till people trying to do suicide. And meaning I'd never smoked uh, cannabis actually, so I'm, I'm, I'm not an expert in that. Yeah, but I don't think cannabis can have these deep sort of effect. And again, this, these deep effects, if they channeled rightly, they're very healing. But uh, I would be terrified yeah, if someone that would be sold everywhere, because I think we would have a, 
uh, within a week, yeah, uh, um, an army of, uh, of, of things go wrong. Well, I, sorry, Anne, if I could just say one quick thing to that. I mean, I agree with you in the cultural context we currently live in, in terms of like Western civilization. But these same powerful substances used within a, co a cultural context, like the Mazotec people of Mexico with psilocybin or peyote with, with, with Native Americans, there, there can be enough of a cultural and educational context that you don't need you know, prescription drug rules in order to control it. But if, if you were to, so I'm agreeing with you, Christian, in the sense that if, if today or any time in the near future in you know, the UK or Germany or the United States, you made psilocybin available in every corner shop, that would be incredibly dangerous. And I don't want to see that happen. And yet I do want to imagine a future society in which we don't have to rely on threats of arrest or criminalization in order to say this is where you can use it and you can't use it. I'd rather use you know cultural norms and education to guide people into safe and beneficial experiences. If I'm having, I like the utopia, and I'm by the way, I'm completely because I'm on the in, in a personal use case, I'm on a on the extreme spiritual side uh, of the spectrum. But if you go, for example, in what you mentioned, yeah, if you go in literally every single historical context from the uh, the mysteries in Eloises to, um, to, to, to Central America, whatever, they always were used in a religious or tribal or a social context. Yeah? And so there was always, so what I would like to say, like, because people are saying, oh, look at the native uh, people or look at the ancient use case, it was always free. It was actually never free, meaning they have different the word, like, but they, it was always embedded in a, in a cultural use case. Yeah. And all of these use cases, every single one, and I have like, I can't run around now, but I have these, uh, these art collection of ancient artifacts from, from Mexico to ancient Greece and ancient Egypt, actually, it dates back my oldest artifact, which shows a psychedelic use case is 5,500 years old from, a, from, a, from an Egyptian tomb. Uh, they always were in, in, in with a guide because all these settings were, as, as, as they were religious or tribal, they were always with guides, always, they had always a purpose as well. It was again, it was never a party use. It was always a rite of passage or, or, or anything. And I think yes, if we would come back to society to that, but then we would also need to talk, which I would be very happy that we need sort of a new, sort of positive social norms and more spirituality in our lives, where then you have practically, maybe not a medical guide, but like some guide, yeah, in your community, whatever, doing that, yeah, but like. As that's not the case, unfortunately. Maybe it's it's developing with these drugs, yeah. But um, but uh, that's a long way to go. I would be very happy about that, indeed. We will maybe experience some of this in 2021, which is going to be a very interesting year. We have to wrap it up, unfortunately. It, we could oh, go on like, quick. forever. <laughs> that was fast. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a little coffee table conversation. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, thank you so much for being part of this today. It was great to have you on the show. Thank you show for moderating it, friends. as always. Sorry. And um, I hope you still enjoy our other second half, which is an interview I did with Benjamin Mark, um, a journalist from the Spiegel, who wrote uh, a book about his depression and then his time in psychiatry. And I thought it's a great idea to have like a patient story also on, on this conference. And we subtitled it so everybody can understand it because we did the conversation in German. But um, yeah, thank you again. It was great. Thanks so much. Thank you, Anne. Thank you.